Yeah. Um, so for a bit of context, so James, the James Webb Space Telescope is made of 18 hexagonal shaped individual mirrors that do mm -hmm. all of the collecting of light. And together they're like six and a half meters across. But each one has to work in concert with the others to give you a telescope that actually has a mirror that size. Otherwise you've essentially got mirrors that are all facing in different directions. Like you've got a telescope that's cross-eyed basically. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't got a telescope that's actually working together. And so the next couple of, like the next two weeks at least is gonna be essentially moving those mirrors. Well, after something like 25 years of development, construction, and delays, the James Webb Space Telescope finally launched on Christmas Day of 2021, beginning its month-long journey to the L2 Lagrange point a million miles from Earth. They were calling it 27 Days of Terror because the unfolding and development process involves something like 350 points of failure, where if any of them went wrong, the entire mission would be ruined and $10 billion would be wasted. Uh, plus, we just miss out on a ton of amazing space science. But the launch went off without a hitch, managed to deploy with no problems, and at the time of this recording, has just inserted itself into its L2 orbit. But as it was on its way, and still, you know, in the process of nailing all the milestones, I thought it'd be a good time to catch up with astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smithhurst and get her thoughts on the launch and what she's looking forward to from the telescope. Dr. Becky, if you don't know, has an awesome YouTube channel, but far more impressive, she is an actual astrophysicist at Oxford University who focuses on supermassive black holes in her research, and she's the author of the book Space at the Speed of Light. And actually, since we recorded this interview, she was awarded the Winton Medal from the Royal Astronomical Society for her research into galaxy formation and evolution. And most importantly, she's a friend of the channel. We spoke a couple of years back, so when JWST launched, I knew she was who I wanted to get on the podcast to talk about it. This interview was recorded about a week into the new year. So some of what we have talked about um, has progressed since then. It was still kind of on its way out there when we were talking. So you'll hear some of the anxiety we both had around that. But uh, uh, Dr. Becky is a wealth of knowledge about the Webb telescope and what we can expect to learn from it. But on top of that, we talk about sci-fi movies and other stuff and, and just catch up. So I want to thank her for coming on and for sharing her thoughts and expertise. It was good catching up. But for now, I'll stop talking and get into my conversation with Dr. Becky. So uh, I'll start with I'll start with an inappropriate but relevant question. Okay. Has your butt stopped clenching yet? <laughs> yeah, um, just about squeaky bum time, as we call it in the UK. <laughs> it's, it's what people refer to it when they talk about like football matches getting into like past the ninetieth minute, like you're in squeaky bum time. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, just about. Um, I feel like the biggest stressful point is over with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I feel like we have more control and more practice, at least at the things to come, rather than the unfolding process, which had just never been done before. Mm -hmm. So so what are the next? I'm such an optimist. I'm sitting here like, what can still go wrong? You know, <laughs> so, so, so what, like you just said, the, the stuff that's yet to come, we have more practice in that. So like, what does that entail exactly? Yeah. Um, so for a bit of context, so James, the James Webb Space Telescope is made of 18 hexagonal shaped individual mirrors that do mm -hmm. all of the collecting of light. And together they're like six and a half meters across. But each one has to work in concert with the others to give you a telescope that actually has a mirror that size. Otherwise, you've essentially got mirrors that are all facing in different directions. Like you've got a telescope that's cross-eyed basically. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't got a telescope that's actually working together. And so the next couple of, like the next two weeks at least is going to be essentially moving those mirrors into their like focused positions, right? So each kind of one needs to be shifted it. slightly. Yeah, exactly. So there's these little um, like electronic motors at the back of each mirror. So there's seven behind each mirror. They're called actuators. And essentially you've got six on there to essentially change the tilt of the mirror. And then you've got one that actually can curve the mirror as well. Oh, wow. So this is actually something we have a lot of practice on. So a lot of the new generation telescopes that have been built on the ground have something called adaptive optics on them, mm -hmm. which I like to describe as like the noise canceling headphone kind of thing for telescopes, right? Mm -hmm. They essentially, if you ever seen these images of telescopes with giant lasers poking out of them? Yeah. Like just, yeah, yeah. So that laser is essentially recording, like if, if you fight a laser against the wall right now, it would be a perfect 
like point of light against the wall right but pointing through the atmosphere it gets completely disturbed by all the turbulence in the air and so you get this like fuzzy blob instead Mm -hmm. if you can record what that fuzzy blob looks like you can then curve your mirrors to adapt for the fuzziness that's being introduced by the atmosphere so then when you take a picture of a star it then comes out super clear obviously that that has never been explained to me before (laughs) No, that's really cool. I, I always thought that it they were awesome. that they were like tracking something with the laser, but but you're saying it's actually like an atmospheric thing. Mm-hmm. So sometimes they can be laser guide stars. Sometimes, mm. so for telescopes, to, for telescope tracking to work perfectly, because you know, because the Earth is rotating, so this, we're moving underneath the sky, and if you want to focus on one target, you need to move with it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, if you don't have a star nearby that's very bright that you can use to keep your position fixed, sometimes they use a laser to do that instead. Okay. But most of the time, it's because they're being used for this adaptive optics. And that adaptive optics, curving those mirrors, works with these actuators, these little electronic motors on the back. So we have a lot of experience using these things to mold and bend mirrors how we want them to be molded and Mm -hmm. bended. And James was obviously very special because it's in space. (laughs) So we don't have to worry about adaptive optics or anything. But we know that like, if we design a mirror in the lab in Earth conditions, when it gets to space, it's going to deform because of the temperatures anyway. Mm -hmm. So they were designed to be the wrong shape in the lab, knowing that they would deform. But you don't want to pin all your hopes on that, right? You still want some control over which way they tilt and what curvature they have. So that's why we've got these actuators in them. So the next two weeks is essentially going to be pick a bright star and you'll have 18 different images of it on your detector from each of the individual segments of the of the telescope mm-hmm. and slowly but surely they'll move each individual one to bring that image basically into the very center and then eventually all of the images will line up and you'll have a telescope that works in concert basically and they'll do that with so there's actually four detectors on board James Webb it's not just like point and shoot telescope right there's actually right. four things at the back that can like take the light that it collects and do something with it so they'll use one of them to do all that sort of focusing and commissioning phase but then they'll have to switch on all of them basically <laughs> they'll right. have to switch on every single one of those i'll have to make sure that that um, the light's coming in and is focused right for that that it's doing what it was supposed to and also we kind of just have to wait for the telescope to cool down like we, we, I mean, one of the most stressful parts of the whole un- unfold process was this sun shield. This right. five layers yeah. of reflective stuff that you know takes it from a 250 degree difference in temperature. That's uh, in Celsius or Kelvin, either side. 250 degrees. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. I'm sorry. I should have should have looked up my conversions <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> in American. Um, but it's probably about 400 Fahrenheit ish. But um, yeah, that temperature difference, right? It, half of it, yeah, is obviously having the shield. But then, you know, you, you have something that's come from an, an Earth environment that is just slowly cooling. It's just radiating its heat into space. Thankfully, because of the sun shield, it's not getting any more radiation from space. Mm. So over time, it will just cool and keep cooling as well. And it's really crucial that that happens because this is an infrared telescope, literally mm. infrared light heat, essentially. So if you have, like, that's why the sun shield exists, because otherwise the sun would just be this huge big source of noise in the sky and you wouldn't be able to detect anything else it's just a stadium yeah. floodlight basically um so all <laughs> this cooling process is a bit it's a bit of a waiting game mm. really um a slow excruciating waiting game <laughs> essentially so it's it's going to be months of of basically an eye test of better here or better here better here better here better here yeah. for 18 mirrors <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah five, comparing about, it to my eye doctor visits that, yeah <laughs> yeah exactly um five months of that um it'll actually get to its final like position where it will do science in about two weeks though and that'll be a right nice milestone to know it's there at least but it'll it, it do L2. all that commissioning there yes l2 yeah. this point that's 1.5 million kilometers away mm-hmm. from from earth where it's orbits the sun I wonder how much of our collective anxiety about it was is because of Hubble. And mm. I mean, I, I was I'm old enough to remember when when Hubble went up and it came back with blurry images and it was just like this. Oh, God, seriously. And, but they were able to fix that, <laughs> thankfully. Um, yeah. But this one, obviously, they can't they can't fix that one. So. Um, exactly yeah i think they've learned lessons from hubble because hubble's issue was a mirror issue and this is why we have now a lot of control over the mirrors mm-hmm. with james webb because even if there is what well, the problem was with hubble was essentially you have to grind these mirrors super smooth 
and they were basically ground a little bit too much in one area, which is what made it so that the mirror wasn't perfect and reflecting the light nicely and you got a, a furry image. Um, so because we can adjust the curvature and the tilt of all these different mirrors, we should have a lot more control. Like this thing actually would have worked. So I don't know if you know that the very last step in the unfold process was sort of like, uh, the sort of wings of this this hexagonal mirror array mm. were, were tucked in and they had to like fold out to give you this full hexagon it would have actually worked if that had failed like if we just had the middle segments we could have you know tilted and folded everything so uh -huh. that it would still work not quite to the same level we would have hoped because it wouldn't have been as big and a big telescope means you can see fainter and further things yeah. small things um and so but it still would have worked we still could have made it work um, and so even if there's something wrong with, with one of the segments or something, which we, we hope not, the lessons have been learned from the past, um, yeah. and they've been tested thoroughly in the lab and all of the <laughs> delays, um, we, uh, we still have some control over it and we can still adjust for anything that is wrong, but fingers mm. crossed, touch wood. It is. I was, I was wondering about that one, cause I've, <laughs> I've had NASA's, um, website, the, where is James mm -hmm. Webb, uh, yeah. It's on, I just have a tab up on both of my computers and I just like check it every day. And, and when it got to that point where there was still the two sites, like after the, the heat shield was up and it was like, oh, you know, um, yeah. And, and they still have we 75% of the single failure point. Right. Like, that was like a, okay. Well, there's that one part of the unfolding where there's the cover that kind of just rolls out like Swiss cake rolls mm -hmm. or something. And I mean, that just yeah. seems like magic to me. Like the whole time I was like, how does that even work? <laughs> you yeah, know, I think it was just all pulled by motors. It was incredible. Like when people say feet of engineering, I don't think it quite covers this. Like, yeah. I think even I mean, the engineers are surprised it worked. <laughs> like every engineer <laughs> I thought he's like, really? They pulled it off. You know, so. <sighs> Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think as long as I have known what James Webb space telescope was, I've been, um, I don't know, a Debbie downer about it a little bit, or just like, mm -hmm. just, just anxious about it, you know, cause there's just so many things that can go wrong. And so like, yeah. now that it's already out there and it's, it's looked like you said, it's like 75% of the, the fault problems. Oh, and are, our, like you know? most of them passed. Yeah. That was the yeah. show was 75%, but yeah, I think it was I'm, because I'm not, we still almost didn't want to let around. ourselves hope, you know, that was, yeah. really cool. we were all like, <laughs> I can't let myself get too excited right. just in case, you know, <laughs> but you did let yourself get too excited. Cause I just, I was just watching your live reaction to the launch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's adorable. I mean, um, I mean, the launch though was such a milestone that I yeah, almost couldn't yeah. believe we were finally there because it had got pushed back so many times. And the fact that it was on Christmas Day, which I was right. so annoyed about. I was like, oh. can I just enjoy <laughs> my Christmas, please, without this added stress? Um, but it all went absolutely <laughs> perfectly. And what's amazing, so because the launch was as perfect as it was, after launch, after the telescope had been deployed, you know, you then need to know if it's on the right track. You know, did the launch put you too high, too low? You would then have to burn some of the spacecraft fuel to bring you back on the right trajectory right. to to get to L2. And, you know, they'd always said to us, like, the launch is not going to be perfect. So we don't know what kind of lifetime we're going to get out of James Webb because the lifetime depends on how much fuel is left. And we've basically mm -hmm. been told probably five to 10 years, like, you know, five was going to be the worst case is well not worst case because <laughs> we would have had a telescope <laughs> not having a telescope would have been the worst case yeah. but like in the best worst case it would have been five years <laughs> and in the best it would have been 10 um but they announced like significantly more than 10 years a couple of days ago and then just yesterday they came out and said they've done all the the, the analysis they they run all the mass they think we're going to have 20 years of operations wow i hadn't heard that yeah and, and like it to go from like five years. Okay. We'll do as much as we can in the time we have, like barely anyone's going to get time. People are going to have to apply in big groups to use James Webb while uh -huh. we still can to then go to like 20 years, like think what we can do wow. in that time, because it means that like, if James Webb finds something that's interesting, you then have the time to follow that up and do extra observations that you might need you have time to find more like if it finds something weird you have time to then find more weird things like mm -hmm. so so much more time is then is then given to lots of different science pursuits and that's why i think it's going to be so transformative it was going to be transformative anyway but i think the, the extra 15 years because isa's ariane 5 rocket put it in the right place like, yeah that's incredible 
Yeah, that's that's such a feather in the cap for Isa to to have nailed it that that well. That's yeah, because it was a load of people, a load of like you know like Elon Musk's fanboys being like, "Why aren't we launching it with SpaceX? Like, oh, why no, is yeah. Isa's <laughs> Ariane Five? And it's like, well, because Isa's Ariane Five's launched a lot of things to L two before. It's like the guy is spacecraft, and like you know, and you know, SpaceX and they probably had that contract had- before SpaceX really existed. So <sighs> yeah, exactly. So yeah. I mean, it was great to see the Ariane Five do it so well, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm really really pleased. And I think that's what people just need reminding. Like you were saying, like oh, we you know Hubble, you remember like everything going wrong and stuff and people are like this is gonna be so far away this isn't the first time we've sent anything to l2 like the, the guy spacecraft that's out there now that's like surveying a billion stars in the milky way like positions and everything that's at l2 the Planck mm. satellite that got the image you know the really famous splotchy blue red and yellow of the cosmic microwave background yeah like the sort of egg-shaped one that was at l2 and it was operating as well like we, we've sent oh, stuff that. to l2 before yeah and we've, we've communicated with them we've got science back you know, we've kept them there. We've, we've got them there. It's just the fold out that was the crucially new thing. It's it's the getting something from this big to a tennis court size yeah. in space. Like exactly. I've seen some some renderings of Louvoir, mm-hmm. which is still conceptual, right? They're not actually building that yet or anything. Um, or are they? It's been commissioned, but I don't think there's like a, a, a design uh, like okay. in place yet. So maybe don't quote me on that. Well, I, I, you know, this is the animations and it's just like this tiny little thing and it expands out like 80 feet. And I'm like, how, 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 how does that work? Well, you know, once you've Lots done it once with James Webb, uh, <laughs> we I guess. do it again. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, one, one that I'm most excited about is, I mean, this is, you know, a good 15, 20 years in the future would be the Lisa spacecraft, which is oh, a gravitational, gravitational wave, wave detector. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So you need this like L-shaped <clears throat> thing essentially to act like a what's called an interferometer, right? Is that you get interference from waves. And so you know that it's a gravitational wave passed through. And basically the, the bigger your gravitational wave detector, the, um, I guess what would be the right word to use? Like the gravitational waves from the bigger the object you can detect. <laughs> it's quite very, but like you can detect gravitational waves from bigger black holes, essentially. So it's uh-huh. like super massive black holes the stuff I really care about. Like you could detect those kind of gravitational waves rather than the ones on the ground right now, like LIGO, which detect them from piddly ones that are only 60 times the mass of the sun rather than 60 million times the mass of the sun. You know? <laughs> um, and so w- in terms of bigger, when I say bigger, I mean like, I mean like sort of across the earth's orbit sized of gravitational mm. wave detector. So you see the designs for this thing and like how James Webb is at L2, this like stationary point in the earth's sun orbit, you'll essentially have three of these, uh, what essentially just mirrors reflecting lasers back and forth as acting as interferometers like across the earth's sun orbit <laughs> and just like trailing them in their orbit and you're like how is that gonna work wow. how are we gonna like coordinate that you know but i, I think i didn't realize it was that big i knew it was gonna be yeah large far larger than um, uh, mm-hmm. ligo but uh wow yeah, if you're gonna so you're gonna go space you know go big Go big. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> good point. We're, we're running out of space up there in space. Where are we going to fit all this? Well, um, I think we're running out of space around Earth, but not the rest of the space. So, <laughs> Isn't it kind of crazy? Like when I, when I think back just over the last few years with the gravitational wave stuff, like that's a whole new era of, of astronomy that never even existed before. Yeah. And we then they. a whole new way of seeing. Right. Yeah. And, and then they imaged a black hole for the first time. Mm-hmm. the event horizon telescope is that yep yeah yeah and now Still we have waiting on web. the sagittarius a images but you know <laughs> okay. which one is that oh is that the uh, so they, they released m87 yeah so now they're doing the milky way's black hole but it's a lot more difficult because a lot more dust in the way mm. um and everything so it's taking a really long time to process it and like two years ago they were like oh it'll be soon and now i'm like i know there was a pandemic but like how soon yeah. is soon <laughs> i'm impatient now <laughs> i just i don't know like um, I'm just kind of blown away with just the things that we've seen in the last few years. And now we've got this massive technological achievement up there with, with the web telescope. And it's just, it's kind of mind blowing. Like what, what are we going to, are our brains ready for what we're about to find? You know? <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Like if we, if we detect, if we not, if we detect like I mean, we've detected signatures of water in, in exoplanet atmospheres before, but if we detect something that's, 
you know, water and oxygen and nitrogen that is almost equivalent to Earth. We don't just detect one of those. We detect, I don't know, 50, 100, mm-hmm. 200. Are we, are we ready for that? Like as, as, as humanity as a whole, right? <laughs> to know that there are that many Earth, not just Earth-like, but almost ide- Earth-identical planets out there. Like, yeah. I don't know if we're ready for that. I mean, I'm definitely ready to know <laughs> yeah. whether, um, like, you know, what happened with the first stars when they formed and if, like, black holes formed before stars or stars before black holes. I would be uh, quite, quite like to know that. Uh, and James Webb should answer that, um, this sort of chicken or the egg scenario. Um, but I think there are other things that, like, will be exciting, will be completely serendipitous with James Webb. I reckon, like, you know, someone will apply for time to look at this interesting cluster of galaxies over here somewhere, and then all of a sudden there'll be some weird thing that we've never seen before that we don't Mm. know if it's in the foreground or the background or at the same distance, and we'll just be like, what is that? And there'll be a whole ream of follow-up, and I'm I'm sure there'll be so much stuff like that, and I'm really excited for those things. The stuff that, you know, didn't go in uh, the, the first proposal, for web right that they didn't know to put in because nobody knew that this existed yet and it turns out to be like the biggest thing like that's that's what i'm excited for that that is an interesting thought that there's there's now that we got extra time with it there's mm-hmm. going to be like a second wave of uh tests and experiments and proposals i guess is the word you just used mm-hmm. um based off of what we see at the beginning that we can't mm-hmm. even imagine now mm-hmm. yeah 100 yeah. because like so the first call for proposals, which is call for proposals, is like the term we use, like as astronomers, like if we want to, you know, apply for time on a telescope to do something, that the observatory would be like, you know, call for proposals is open deadline in a few months or whatever. Um, so the first call for proposals, the deadline for James Webb was November 2020, and that was for six thousand hours, which is about two hundred and fifty days or so. And then mm. you've got like, you know, the director of the observatory has like their specific science they want to do and there'd already been some other proposals and whatever that was discretionary time so basically they they like did a call for a year so the first like after the first five months of commissioning they know what observations are going to be done with web for the next year so let's let's say that's like to june 2023 Mm -hmm. right so we know exactly what science is going to be done then but it's based on what we expect james webb to do and right. I can imagine, like you say, say if the, the call for, like, maybe not the next call for proposals, it'll probably be like, what, November this year, uh, November 2022 for, for like the next year's ob- ob- observing. They probably won't be influenced by the first year's worth. It'll probably be influenced by the commissioning to be like, this is the limitations that we now know and can mm. confirm. Mm. But like the third cycle of observations <laughs> is going to be like massively impl- in, uh, influenced by what the first cycle, like, having done all the analysis written up you know published it to the world people are going to be like whoa right we should look at this then right. because if it can do this it might, you know and so i i think it's going to be really interesting you know in the next five years or so to see what surprises come out so is that about the time frame you think that that would start to happen in about five years i think so yeah um i think I think we're looking at sort of like the first science data and my colleagues having their hands on the data sort of like, you know, late this year, like mid late this year. So like June, if you're lucky, and you know, you get scheduled first, um, but you know, mm. probably more like September, October for most. Uh, and then obviously they'll take a couple of months to analyze it, a couple of months to write it up and then publish it. So sort of late next year, 2023, you're then looking at people being influenced by that first data that's come out and been published and stuff and then that's going to take a while to filter through to the next cycle and then filter through to to get data and proposals out so in about five years time i think those sort of like weird things that we didn't know web could do uh Hmm. studies are going to start coming out that's cool so how exactly does that work is it i mean (laughs) i'm going to sound like a total capitalist here for a second can you like is it do you pay for is that like a source of revenue for for the web team to like do you pay for time on the telescope or is it all based on merit or is there like a committee that decides yeah so it's all based on merit so but like in terms of payment for it obviously you've got different governments that have bought into it and then universities therefore then get access through their governments and everything and that's Mm. how most observatories work like with James Webb, it's, it's sort of pretty much an, an open, if you ha- if you know someone who's at a US NASA-based or a, a European ESA-based institute, as long as you put them on your proposal, like you'll be able to get time kind of thing. Um, 
Whereas there are, you know, there are some where, you know, you have to know someone specifically at UCSD, for example, to like get time on this uh, mm. telescope that's up in California, for example. Um, so it's a bit more open in terms of with like, a, with like a NASA observatory or an ESA observatory. Um, and what happens is essentially you write a proposal. You're like, this is the science that I do. This is why we care about it. There's still this unsolved problem. We need to fix it. Here's how this telescope can help us fix it. Mm -hmm. These are the observations I plan to do. These are the targets. So like 10 galaxies, 20 galaxies, or five planets, 10 planets, whatever it is you're looking at. Uh, and this is why I need this many. So usually you have to be like, I need the statistics or like, or we can just get it from this few. And obviously then depending on how many you want to observe with your statistics, you need more time. And then it becomes more difficult to schedule you if you ask for too much time. So it, it's a little bit of a, a trade-off in that respect, but a lot of observatories obviously you do that and then you have a panel that reviews it all and they decide who gets time because usually so the, the telescope i'm currently trying to get time on is the the vlt the very large telescope in chile mm -hmm. has an instrument on it called muse like the band um <laughs> and it essentially instead of taking like one uh observation of, of a, like an entire galaxy it can take like 200 of them it like splits it up like a jigsaw so you get each individual region and that is seven times oversubscribed like the number of hours uh, that are asked for based on like literally the number of hours in a, in a night in the space of six months there are like there's seven times more hours asked for than they physically have to give oh okay um so it's really competitive process uh -huh. um and that's why your proposal that's like this is why we care and this is why we should do this that's what you know it has to be convincing um, mm -hmm. And I don't envy the people who end up being on panels and I'll probably have to, you know, it's like jury duty. Like I probably have to serve my time at some point on, a, on an observation, <laughs> like a telescope selection panel. Cause like, well, we gave you time three years ago. So now you can oh, read through all the people's okay. proposals that want time now. Like it's, it's one of those huh. things that you do like peer review, you know, sure. if you publish in a journal, you then have to review somebody else's uh, as, as, as a, you know, peer um, to say whether that is science is legit and should be published and stuff. It's a simple mm -hmm. thing. It's like a service role. You're not paid for it. You're just sort of expected to do it if you, you know, want everyone else to do it for you. So. Mm. Such a different world. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, it's one funny way you can get done when like, it's not really based on money. <laughs> Cause it's so funny when <laughs> no, you see people, when I'm you just... see all these like, <laughs> when you see these conspiracy theorists online being like these scientists are just in it for the money and it's like what money like what yeah. what <laughs> Point, where <laughs> are all these billionaire scientists you're talking about here <laughs> please yeah. can you tell me how how they're doing that because i would like to know <laughs> but that's an interesting perspective though because i mean i think we talked about this last time that it's 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 kind of a walled garden the whole academic world that the rest mm. of us aren't really all that privy to um i don't think it's by design it's just that's just how it is you know but yeah. uh, um, the whole idea of <laughs> maybe this says something about me. I don't know. But like the fact that I'm just sitting here like, but who pays for this? How does this get funded? Like, like there's there's a janitor at that telescope, right? Who pays that guy? Like there's there's some there's some economic system going on there. And yeah, I'm guessing it's just the universities pay for it or. Yeah. In the way that universities are funded by taxpayers and that governments have uh science budgets you know yeah, like okay. it, it all filters down and through so like my phd for example is paid by the science technology facilities council which i think is like the the nsa in the us at like the national science administration um mm. that's a uk government funded science body essentially that decides like oh we will fund this many astronomy phds this year and this many how many phds and they also then divvy up the money to buy into different telescopes and observatories and stuff like that as well mm -hmm. So let's just say, what if what if Jeff Bezos was looking for a new planet to expand Amazon into <laughs> and wanted time on the James Webb Space Telescope? Could he buy his way mm -hmm. into it? He could build another one himself, could he, couldn't though? he? He probably could if he had the money. Oh, does he have 10 billion? Oh, dollars yeah. <laughs> it was like does, 120 yeah. or something like that. Yeah, sure. It's like a drop in in yeah. drop in the ocean, it's right? His, it's in, in his of, couch like, cushions right now. Budget in, the, in his budget, yeah. I'm sure he could if he really wanted to. If he wanted to to build another one, um, he could he could fight it. Um, <laughs> I don't think he could buy his way on. I don't know. In my in my experience, it's just it's just based 
surely on merit, but I don't mm. know how much money you could throw at the problem until someone goes, oh, okay, that could fund, you know. <laughs> yeah. That could, that could fund like, you know, I don't know, maybe like a hundred postdocs for five years each or something and we could get so much more done with that money. Sure, give him half an hour, <laughs> like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it must be a point that you reach where people are like, okay, this is more advantageous to science to just give him the time. Yeah, just give him, just give him a couple hours. To, uh, just give him some fake data, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> given the simulated stuff we did five years ago <laughs> but what was the line in contact where uh, he says the rule of first rule of government spending why build one when you can build two at twice the price <laughs> yeah i a big i finally watched that actually contact because you told me to watch it you know last time we spoke oh that's right you hadn't seen it i hadn't seen it and you were like you cannot be an astronomer and have not seen contact you were like well, I not i'm not it. qualified <laughs> to say that i hope i didn't say that <laughs> it was oh, that was paraphrased but yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh did you do like a, a video about it or a reaction yeah i did like i started this like astrophysicist react series to lots of sci-fi and stuff and contact was definitely the most fun to film because it it actually tried to represent like the world of science and academia and research and stuff like that really well obviously because it was Carl Sagan so he knew what he was writing and yeah. so I just did Don't Look Up actually as well the new Netflix film about this sort of like political point, yeah. satire and stuff whatever like it that's that does a very good job at trying to represent like what it would actually be like to be a, a PhD student or an academic or whatever and stuff like that um, and so those kind of films I, I, I quite like and this the React series are not like it's never like oh this is bad science or whatever like this is just kind of like where is the line between the science and the fiction in this mm -hmm. sci-fi thing for those who don't necessarily know hi i'm joe scott you might remember me from the podcast you were just listening to and i'm here to talk to you about curiosity stream have you ever found yourself endlessly scrolling through titles on one of your streaming services and you just can't find anything that really gets your brain going and maybe you thought to yourself, it sure would be neat if there was a streaming platform that only streamed high-quality, mind-blowing documentaries and educational programs from some of the best filmmakers around the world? Have you ever wanted that? Well, so you're in luck, because that, my friend, is CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the premier streaming service for documentaries and educational programming with thousands of titles to choose from and everything from history to futurism, science to art, whatever you're interested in, you can find it there. Seriously, the only problem with CuriosityStream is that it's littered with rabbit holes that you can easily get lost in, so be sure to pace yourself. And they're always adding new content, like the series What Went Wrong, that examines some of the biggest disasters and mysteries of the last 50 years, including the Challenger disaster, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, and London's Greenfell Tower fire that killed 72 people in 2017. Oh, and have you ever been watching really great documentary programming and thought to yourself, hey, it sure would be neat if there was something like that for my favorite YouTubers? If so, then you're in even more luck because when you sign up for CuriosityStream, you get free access to Nebula, a streaming service created by some of your favorite YouTubers where you can see their videos ad-free and where they can feel free to experiment and try new things without the dreaded algorithm hanging over their heads. I'm on Nebula, actually, and it's the only place you can see my Nebula-exclusive series, Mysteries of the Human Body, where we delve into the weird and sometimes scary world of unexplained diseases. It's a fun time. There's also original series from Real Engineering, Windover Productions, Legal Eagle, Minute Body, the list goes on and on. Nebula is like our own little piece of the internet, and you're welcome to join us. And the crazy thing is, you get both of these streaming services at a ridiculous discount if you sign up at my special link, which is curiositystream.com slash joescottpod. That's curiositystream.com slash j-o-e-s-c-o-t-t-p-o-d. You'll get 26% off the annual rate, bringing the grand total for both of these amazing streaming services to $14.79 for an entire year. So one more time, that's curiositystream.com slash joescottpod, and you can start streaming smarter. And thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this podcast. And now, back to the show. So, uh, yeah, I was curious what you thought of Don't Look Up. I mean, obviously it's satire, so it's... Yeah, it is satire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, was, it was, I mean, I don't want to spoil it for people, but they were like, the. I wasn't expecting the ending. I was still expecting a Hollywood ending. Um, <laughs> and um, I didn't get it. And I was like, what? Um, the funniest thing for me was, and I don't know how you feel about this as being a science communicator as well. And like probably having had media training at some point, the, the, the weirdest bits was like seeing like the very realistic them trying to communicate with the media and then being like just make it light and fluffy you know I've been told that so mm. many times because mm. like oh we have to make the science stuff like light and fun um and stuff like that and it was just like it was uh, that was so real to me in the sense of like I can see what they were trying to portray there and I can see why so many people have compared it to climate change as well 
like sort of like climate change denial um and specifically human accelerated climate change i feel like you know mm -hmm. should be stated there um and uh sort of people burying their heads in the sand about it and if there almost was a six month deadline you feel like more would get done but because it's this long drawn out thing people almost don't want to hear it and, and don't want to make changes right and i can see what how that parodied it parodied it um apparently my, my parents watched it and like saw me a little bit in uh, jennifer lawrence's character they were like oh she should do that there i should do that there and i was like okay well fair enough i probably wouldn't scream <laughs> <laughs> on live yeah. tv but go sure. and yell f-bombs on live tv <laughs> yeah. well i haven't i haven't had any actual like media training um so I mean, I guess, I guess you've, you've appeared on some TV shows, and they were they were kind of doing the same thing. It's like this is science, so we don't want to put people to sleep. So let's just you know <laughs> keep it fun or something. Yeah, yeah. So like I do um, BBC Breakfast a lot in the UK, um, which I I actually do love doing BBC Breakfast. I have been told I have the enthusiasm to do breakfast, <laughs> like breakfast <laughs> <daily>. <laughs> which I think is a compliment. Um, but yeah, often like the instructions when you speak to producers for for that, or for, I do a lot of radio as well and stuff as well. There, you know, the the brief is like you know we just want to make it you know fun. And I remember when there was the the Russian like. A DSAT test recently where the, the the Russians blew up one of their satellites. Yeah. Do you remember this? It was a mm -hmm. couple of months ago. Um, and they were like, oh, can you come on and explain it like in a light and fun way? And I was like, I don't think we can make this one light and fun. <laughs> it's quite serious news because they're putting a lot of like tech up there at risk. But, you know, things like um, the, you know, the Perseverance mission on Mars and stuff. It's like, okay, let's make it light and fun. And that kind of stuff you can. Um, mm. And I think it's just because like, yeah, I mean, most of the news at the minute, especially, is quite depressing. So if you can add a little bit of joy from, you know, there was a tiny yeah. drone flew on Mars, then that's obviously something that you need to do. But it's it's recognizing, like, not you know, not all science news can always be light and fun. Um, yeah. Some yeah. of it is fairly serious. And the important stuff is not so light and fun. Mm -hmm. The stuff that people need to hear. Um, I actually don't watch a whole lot of news, but... Um, my wife does and so i wind up just kind of catching it and it is funny how like it's just death and destruction and depressing and everything and then the very last segment is like this old man who walked a marathon and and yeah. raised money for kids or something and it's like this light thing and i feel like yeah. sometimes the science stuff kind of gets shoehorned in there especially especially things like perseverance like hey science did this crazy thing yeah um, it always makes me nerd out uh, and i'm gonna nerd out in a minute as well because there's a bit in um order of the phoenix in the book of harry potter where he's like lying in the flower beds at the very beginning of the book listening to the the muggle news thinking he's gonna hear something about voldemort coming back and it's like and they got to a piece on like water skiing budgies <laughs> <He was> like, <laughs> i think that's it for the news they would put any more serious ahead of water skiing budgies so anything like that any light piece of news i'm like oh it's the, it's the water skiing budgie news piece <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> I just water really skiing what? what was the budgie <laughs> budgie like a, a, a small bird a budgie like a oh okay a, yeah a water um, skiing, there may be a british like, bird. bird i don't see any over here yeah maybe you have different names for it I could we have up. grackles it's a beautiful name that is a good name but yeah you know, like a, like a tiny little yellow bird that you would keep and like like a tweety bird kind of thing oh, okay like a little parakeet or something yeah yeah a budget okay name. okay fair enough <laughs> um no but the the don't look up thing um i think what i think what hit me was that it wasn't even so much that i could totally see this happening mm. if that was the actual situation which i could it's that I feel like I've already seen it. I know. Yeah. A lot of it, like, was, it was just so like, believable. It was more deja vu than anything. Yeah. The thing that got me was like, when they were like, okay, we're going to mine this comet. Right. Mm. Like, that was like one of the ideas. Like, no, we're not going to destroy it. We're going to mine it. I was like, here's an idea. How about you deflect it off course and then you mine it once it's <laughs> gone faster. <laughs> Like, yeah. there's another idea. You could do both. <laughs> yeah, you get plenty of time after it passes Earth to yeah, do you that. Do, you get like eat its entire orbit, long period, back out to the orbit cloud. So however many years you could do it then, you know. Um, even you know when it's past Earth, it's still going to be dead close to Earth. <laughs> Why don't you wait till three months? Out, but it's in the opposite direction, you know. Yeah. So oh my gosh. <laughs> well, and, and then there's the whole thing of like just blowing it up. Doesn't that just create a whole bunch of yeah 
projectiles now. Like it's really oh, yeah. about deflecting it, which Dart just happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Dart just launched. So the, oh, I don't remember what the D stands for, but it's essentially an asteroid redirection test mm -hmm. uh, that NASA is doing. So it launched in September, 2021. Uh, no, no, November, 2021, I think. And it will get Recently. there. Yeah, I think it was November, 2021. And it will get there in September 2022 and it'll mm. essentially just like impact with an asteroid. And with that sort of transfer of energy, it should change its um, trajectory ever so slightly. So it's the one they've picked is not a danger to Earth. It's in orbit around another asteroid. So basically right. we get to test how much energy gets um, transferred by how much its orbit changes. And then we'll know like, okay, well, you can transport this much energy. And if that, this was ever an issue, we could just have this like fresh out of the box, you know, like mm -hmm. why build one when you can build two, <laughs> Let's build yeah. 10 of them just in case, <laughs> like you've got it. So that if you do have six months warning, you can just launch it straight away and you can dealt with the problem. And cause you know, you've got something that's been tested and actually mm -hmm. works. And by doing that calculation, they know exactly how much they would need per kilogram of mass of a, of an asteroid exactly. or something yeah yeah because you don't have to deflect it much that's the thing i think that's what people forget is that orbits are very intricate dance it's not just that the comet's on a direct hit with earth it's the earth is also moving as well mm. so i think it's something like earth moves its entire diameter which is like six thousand meters or something no that's wrong six thousand kilometers <laughs> <laughs> get your units right becky um it moves about that in um oh, that's its radius so it's hang on let's do this again <laughs> God. Um, what was I even saying? Oh, yeah. So Earth moves its entire uh, diameter, which is like 12,000 kilometers or so, I think. And so it moves its entire diameter in about the space of seven minutes, like along its orbit around the sun. Mm. So it's shifted a huge amount in that time, right? If you've got a, like a five to 10 kilometer comet coming, you don't have to shift it. You don't have to delay it by, you know, a minute, two minutes for it to miss Earth completely. Yeah. I mean, very near miss, but it would still miss. It wouldn't be a direct impact. So, I mean, as long as you can just nudge it, you know, slightly, mm -hmm. you don't have to launch nukes and stuff like that. Nukes are a terrible idea. Why does everyone always go to nukes? Like, you don't have nuclear because weapons America. hanging around space. <laughs> oh, the thing, <laughs> oh, there's so many political heartbacks in that film made me laugh. Like, the, the guy who was, like, firing a gun in the, in the sky, like, at the ass, at yeah. the comet, as it was, like, coming down. I was just like, nothing I've ever seen is more American in my entire life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also, classic Hollywood, like, American film, like, like, all mention of NASA, a brief mention of the Russians, Chinese, and Indians doing something or trying to do a deflection mission of their own. No mention of the European Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency. You know, none of their actual, like, you know, mm -hmm. collaborators, some of the biggest space agencies in the world. Like, it's just like, no, yeah. these people don't exist. <laughs> I, I really think that most Americans don't know that any other countries other than Russia have a space program. True. Probably. Um, my biggest beef is, uh, well, okay, so it, they did it on this one, but they said they like brought them back. So I guess that's kind of their way out. And now there's, <laughs> what's this movie called? Moonfall? Oh, have I've you seen, seen this advertised and was like, what is this? The, the moon is crashing into earth and yeah. Um, but I saw it in the trailer of this too. They keep using space shuttles. Yeah. Why? And I'm like, it's been 10 years since we've had a space shuttle leave the but ground. It's also, it's also been 10 years since Pluto was a planet and people haven't forgotten that yet. Either. Well. So <laughs> I think I think that's the thing is that, the, I mean, what are we going to start seeing? You know, like, um, oh, what's it called? SpaceX's oh, Dragon. Are we going to oh, start seeing Dragon like in films in the next 10 years? Like instead, there's just no, I think it's because it's so instantly recognizable and mm -hmm. so iconic. Yeah, and so linked in people's minds with mm. the idea of, of of space exploration that I think that's why it keeps coming back to it. But there's been because there's been so many other launch vehicles, right? You know, that, but yeah. that are also very iconic in themselves. But to a general audience, space shuttle means launching. I bet the majority of people around the world think that the space shuttle is like still in existence <laughs> and working. So you're probably right. Um... It, it it's it's one of these things that just kind of it's like ah stop it for me yeah. but but i think i don't know may, maybe another way of framing it is just kind of to say like it is just such an iconic vehicle that it's kind of hard to even imagine anything else you know for for yeah. a lot of people i certainly had that poster on my wall when i was a kid you know i actually have a lego space shuttle model over there as well in this room right now so i'm sure it's it's rather large it's nice yeah, 
It had a Hubble in it too. It like fully unfolds with the Hubble Space Telescope in it. I love it. It's my present. Lego has come so far <laughs> since, <laughs> since I was a kid. There's a there's a big push to get a Lego James Webb as well now. Oh, there should like be. Like that fully unfolds and unfolds oh and everything God. with all of the steps. Like, oh, can you imagine? No. <laughs> <laughs> It would be amazing. How, how would you Lego a sun shield? I think that might have to not be Lego. Yeah. Or maybe the base of it could be Lego and then you might have to have something else. But I feel like if they did bring one out, the, the like a lot of people around the world would just be like, take my money, take it. <laughs> take oh, sure. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got a, um, I may have shown you this last time, but I think this is the, ah, I broke it. No. <laughs> is that the ELT? It's either the ELT or the 30 meter telescope. I think it's the 30 meter actually. Yeah, probably if it's in the US. And I just broke it oh. trying to pick it up. See, that's what I get. But that's yeah, amazing, though. they, they said it the to me. the things where they use like, they, one of the, so in all the drawings that you see for say the ELT or the 30 meter telescope, like that are the planned observatories of the future, uh -huh. the, the, the scale that seems to, you know, because they put like, you know, person for scale or, you know, a car for scale or something like that. The thing that seems to have become like, a, it's a bit, it started off as a bit of a joke, but it's now become the norm is to use an emperor penguin for scale. Oh, really? <laughs> because, because an emperor penguin is about a meter tall. Okay. Average. So like, it's a really good like unit to be like, that is a meter, right? <laughs> Rather than just putting a meter like rule on it or whatever. So just, you see these like, you know, intricate diagrams of like, you know, this is what the ELT will look like once it's built. And it's just this penguin and you're thinking it's gonna be in the middle of a desert like what is this <laughs> but yeah. so I that's it. that's how it just becomes that's a design aesthetic now yeah the in, in diagrams on the internet it's a banana banana for scale <laughs> sure but bananas very wild wildly mm. you could do a plantain for scale it's even bigger mm. I'll, I'll run it past the people who you know, <laughs> do the blueprints with all its the, uh, the, the units of weights and measures, the whoever runs that. <laughs> yeah. Get it onto the Frenchies. Well, so um, we've talked about James Webb. Um, I know that there's some, some ground-based telescopes. I mean, we were just talking about the 30 meter there. The, mm -hmm. the extremely large telescope is coming along, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's getting built um, up in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Um, separate location to where a lot of the telescopes currently are. It's on its own little sort of hilltop, if you will. Um, most famous, uh, that observatory complex is, it got used in James Bond once, like the the sort of like, it was in the desert, there was cars driving around it. It's all the mm. big glass building. That's where all the astronomers live essentially when they do observing up there with those telescopes, which is quite cool. Um, and it's coming along really nicely. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be like, yeah, the, I think it's 30 meters across like the 30 meter telescope. The idea is that we'll have one in the Southern hemisphere and one in the Northern hemisphere. So 30 meter telescope uh, is, the project is currently halted, but the plan is to build it on the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Right. Um, there's obviously a lot of um, issues with um, the fact that the um, native Hawaiians think that they have, they know that their sacred ground up on top of Mauna Kea has not mm. been respected at all by the scientific community. And that's a huge failing of just sort of like the history of, of building stuff up there and, and people and the government just assuming that it would be okay and not mm. actually speaking to them. It's just a failure of communication massively. And you will speak to some Hawaiians that are like astronomy is so tied to the history of Hawaii and stuff. And they're, they're proud of it, but they just want that ground to be respected. And mm. it, you know, they really don't feel like it has, um, so that was, and it was a very political decision to put it there as well. It could have been put in La Palma in the Canary Islands, but it was a joint project between the US and the Japanese. So Hawaii made the most sense in oh, terms okay. of political. Okay. Anyway, we're getting off track. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you got the 30 meter telescope and you got the ELT. They're going to be two 30 meter telescopes, which, and they're optical telescopes as well, which it's absolutely huge, right? If you can have that with this adaptive optics that we were talking about before, you're going to get sort of, I mean, Hubble, for example, is a 2.5 meter telescope, right? So if you've yeah. got a 30 meter telescope, you can imagine sort of like the difference, especially if you have AO, you need that to get the same kind of detail and clarity that you get with, with Hubble um, up out of the atmosphere. And then you've also got other big telescopes like radio telescopes in development as well. So you've got um, you've got the SKA across South Africa and Australia as well, this big square kilometer array of radio antenna. Mm. So again, like the bigger the telescope, square kilometer, 
<laughs> like yeah. it's it's not an entire single mirror, but it, you can combine uh, antenna that across that distance to make something that's the equivalent size, which is incredible. Yeah, uh, and then so you've I also know, got we, as well. Really? Sorry, so we 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 lost Arecibo. Mm. And there's one in China. Is that the 500 meter telescope? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's so half a kilometer. Mm -hmm. And so now that's there's two full dish. kilometers. Yes, coming. but they're not single dish like Arecibo or the oh. 500 meter telescope in, in in China. So this is just like you can literally they're literally the most like imagine like your TV aerial on top of your house, like an old fashioned like little thing that looks like it's gonna blow over right. in a strong gale. Like it's it, that kind of like antenna. Array. Sometimes they're even just they almost look like little solar arrays, like on the ground as well. Um, but you can literally combine them with telescopes that you know, you know, 100 meters away. I'm sorry, another antenna that's 100 meter away, mm -hmm. um, and you can make something that's a, the equivalent size of a 100 meter right. telescope. Um, gotcha. So it's really clever what they do. Um, so it doesn't have to be single dish, and because obviously making a dish that size, it, it's incredibly <laughs> difficult. It's incredibly yeah. cumbersome, and you get the issues like you had with Arecibo with with you know issues with if one thing goes wrong and the whole thing's wrecked mm -hmm. you know it's very expensive to repair whereas if just one antenna goes you can replace that fairly cheaply yeah. um and then also you've got the 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 probably the one that's going to be switched on the soonest which i think is going to be probably either late this year or early next year depending on commissioning is um the vera rubin observatory um with the yeah. large synoptic sky survey telescope um, which is going to be really exciting. This is in South Africa and it's essentially its job is to just <clears throat> survey the sky. People won't apply for time on it necessarily. It's literally just going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth and look for stuff that changes, but also record, you know, whatever's in the sky at that point. So whether it could be like a background galaxy or, you know, something that's changing in the foreground, whether that's an asteroid going past or whether it's a supernova that's gone off or if there's some variable star or variable source in, in that area of sky it'll keep recording it and so we've done stuff like this before especially in the northern hemisphere the most famous one is the sloan digital sky survey which is like a million galaxies spawned galaxy zoo where people classified images online and stuff and this is going to give us a billion galaxies plus like something like a million alerts a night for stuff that's moving or changing in the sky which is just incredible, like because of its sensitivity, because it's so much bigger, yeah, uh, and because of like all of the the back end stuff in terms of data storage and computer algorithms and everything that's running on the back end as well. Uh -huh. Like I, there, I, when I started my when I was doing my undergrad, I, I one of my teachers was a gamma ray astronomer, and so like this would be like so say a supernova went off or something, and you had a big burst of gamma rays, which is like the highest energy form of light uh, in the sky. The gamma ray telescope would pick it up, and she'd get like an alert on her phone. And it'd be like, whatever you were doing, you had to drop it. Like the data had to come in and you had to like record like that you had that data and you'd received it. And then you could then analyze it the next day or whatever, or you'd analyze it there. And then if you know, you're at work or you were really keen, even if it was the middle of the night, mm -hmm. but can you imagine like people who study that now and getting, you know, there's a million different alerts a night, you know, if you're studying supernova, how do you know that they're not asteroids just moving? How do you know that it's yeah. not a variable star just, just flickering away? How do you know it's not like a, a black hole that's just sort of eaten a big clump of material and that material is shined really brightly as it's dropped in kind of thing? Like there's so many different things it could be. So there's a lot of machine learning algorithms being developed to like filter this sort of stuff out, which is great. But then I'm like, well, what about the stuff that we don't know to look for? Like mm. with that much of an influx of data, is there going to be stuff that we miss that's going to sit on computer hard drives for years before it gets spotted? You know, that happens in, that happened in previous surveys before the stuff like the unknown, the unknown knowns almost like mm -hmm. we could know of them, but we didn't, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of those with uh, the Vera Rubin observatory. Um, and I'm excited for that. Yeah. As you were talking about, I was like, that, it seems like the biggest challenge there is just that data yeah. like management mm. you know yeah it's crazy like that and i think that's one of the things so people always say oh why do we bother studying astronomy like why do we care and you know what sort of thing and you know for me it's like well, i just want to know i'm just generally very curious <laughs> i think humans are just generally very curious yeah. but from like a very practical standpoint it's the unforeseen benefits that you get down the line so for example astronomers were tired with the fact that they couldn't get you know, the accurate representation of how bright something was with, a, you know, a photographic plate that you'd have to expose very cumbersome, you know, in your silver nitrate and whatever like that. So yeah. they invented a digital detector and now we all have one in our mobile phones as a digital camera, right? Yeah. And then Wi-Fi as well, you know, Wi-Fi would be terrible because all the signals bounce off the walls from the router before they make it to your laptop and the signal is really weak. 
Um, but radio astronomers had the same problem. They couldn't combine signals and they worked out a way of doing it and it boosted the signal. And now all, you know, mm. Wi-Fi receivers use that. And then you've got like medical imaging techniques that were developed. Well, they weren't developed for medical imaging. They were developed by astronomers to clear up images and right. remove noise and everything. And now they're used in MRI and CTs. So when you think about looking forward, like, well, what will be the thing that, you know, astronomy will filter down in the future? I think it's going to be stuff to do with, like you said, data management, data storage, data transfer, stuff like that. Because there's a telescope, a radio telescope across Europe. So it's like mostly based in the Netherlands, but it has um, bases, you know, as far north as like up in Scotland and then like down into sort of like uh, Southern Europe as well, down in Italy and stuff like that. And so it's like 2000 kilometers. It spans the different antenna. Um, mm. So it's a huge, huge instrument that it ha- that you end up making, right. By combining these individual ones that are scattered across uh, Europe. Um, and it's taking data faster than they, like astronomers can get it off like servers right like the speeds that they have with with laptops and with supercomputers in their departments like are not quick enough to to actually get it off in terms of the speed it's taking the data at so i think that's going to be the the sort of push forward is like this needs to be improved Mm -hmm. and then you know data transfer speeds improving is going to help people around the world whether it comes to you know just paying for your next vacation or whether it's Mm -hmm. you know some sort of like stock exchange i don't know whatever it might be um i think that's going to be it's going to be quite beneficial if that is pushed forward so that is one of my favorite points to make whenever I inevitably get somebody in a comment or whatever saying like, you know, why are we spending all this money on space and whatnot? It's just like, you just don't understand how different the whole world would be if it wasn't for all that spinoff stuff that came from just the pure science, you know? Yeah. And, and I actually made a video, uh, was sort of kind of defending the whole billionaires in space thing, which I know I'm, I'm, I'm on the opposite side of a lot of people on that one, but I'm just, I'm just like team space. I'm like, you know, the more stuff we put in space and the more we, you know, explore Mm -hmm. and stuff, the better, and it it benefits us all. I kind of made the argument that throughout human history, war was always kind of an accelerator of technology. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of a way of doing that without killing a bunch of people. (laughs) Yeah. You know, like just kind of putting us ourselves in that. Yeah. (laughs) The Cold War. (laughs) Crashing economies and all that. Uh, But sort of creating that, that, that cauldron of, Mm. Uh, well putting us in a place where we need to innovate to yeah. uh, to solve problems and stuff and then that just kind of like filters down to the rest of the world and stuff well yeah because like i mean obviously the cold war inspired the space race and landing on the moon right? yeah. and then if you look at like the number of I've, I've seen it for the u.s i haven't seen it for the world but you can see the number of people applying and gaining phds across all sciences after the moon landings massively mm. peaks mm-hmm sort of through especially like the early to late 70s and then into the early 80s the people who were at that sort of like age where that would have made such a huge impression on them like the moon landings and it's not just in astro or anything like that it was engineering it was computer science so a lot of like the improvements in computing came Mm -hmm. from research that was done by people who were inspired by the moon landings to go into that kind of research as well so there's so much that can't be quantified from stuff like that but also so much of the history of science that is so intricately tied to astronomy like astronomy being like we need to know this but we don't know it so do you know what i mean like pushing Mm -hmm. other sciences Mm -hmm. to figure stuff out as well that then down the line led to other stuff so that yeah. you don't know what is going to come from asking questions like you know when were the first stars formed in the universe it sounds such a simple question but it can have so many rabbit holes you end up tumbling down yeah yeah well and that's another thing. i'm sure you get a lot of this too but um i've had so many people in comments and in emails and stuff tell me that like some subject that i cover i'm not trying to take credit for it. i'm just saying like I, I covered some subject and that like sparked an interest in them to go and blah 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 and now they're getting their master's degree and yeah. this that Those or the, are the other best and emails to receive right isn't that amazing? amazing and again i don't take credit for that but it's just it's just like um the things that we're seeing in science and the space stuff it's it inspires people to mm. to you know make career changes or whatever or go into fields that they wouldn't have thought yeah. to do before and that, that pushes everything forward i think that's really well i cool. was massively inspired by hubble like so mm. i was actually i was born a month after hubble launched Oh wow! So I too will. <laughs> I too will celebrate my one billionth second birthday very soon, Aww. just like Hubble did. And I've got it in my calendar. <laughs> it's like next Friday. I'm very excited. Um, just one billion. Uh, but, yeah, but uh, one billion, not one million. One billion seconds. Well, 
31 and two thirds. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, so I was massively inspired by that growing up, like all of the images that were coming through of like Eagle Nebula and stuff like that as it was taken and gal- galaxies, mm-hmm. especially like seeing big, beautiful spiral galaxies. I had this book when I was a kid that was basically just full of Hubble images. And I was mm-hmm. just absolutely, you know, overawed by it essentially and i think that was what massively inspired me to become an astrophysicist and also massively inspired me to pick galaxies as my field of topic as well and also nearby galaxies that you observe with optical telescopes so you get the big pretty pictures and now like i actually (laughs) use hubble space telescope data like in my research as well which you know it's just nice and nice and circular to think that it's circled back almost to me you guys are like uh, hubble images every day you're a pair you're you're paired up you're like mark twain with Halley's comet you yeah (laughs) came in together no one knows uh, what happened if it ever gets decommissioned I'll i know it. yeah let's uh, I'll, I'll make sure and reach out to you and make sure you're okay um yeah. can i ask one more quick thing and then i think we can kind of uh, bring this thing mm-hmm. around um we touched on this the last time we talked and then the subject kind of moved on and i've always kind of wanted to come back to it and it, mm-hmm. it also happens to line up with the video that i'm working on right now uh about like the satellite constellations that are going up like starlink mm-hmm. right now and the point of my video, which who knows when it'll, it probably has not come out yet by the time this comes out, but mm-hmm. um, uh, it's, not, it's not just Starlink. There's one web, there's Project Kuiper. Yeah. There's another one that I'm blanking on right now. So there's a whole bunch of these going up. And, um, and when we talked last time, you did kind of just touch on the, um, the effects that's going to have on astronomy mm. in terms of like having all these satellites, I guess, kind of clouding and getting in the way and stuff. Um, I was always curious, like you were talking about the adaptive optics with the laser and everything and being able to adjust for atmospheric Mm -hmm. disturbance and everything. Um, Does that also, I'm trying to word this question just right. Does that also apply or could that apply to things in space, be it Starlink or whatever? I mean, it's just, it's getting more crowded up there, but um, are there other ways algorithmically to adjust for that with the ground-based telescopes or is this actually going to be a problem in the future? I mean, if like all these companies were willing to share all of their like positional data telemetry that kind of stuff with like make it public Mm -hmm. we could have algorithms running in the background that could like send up an alert like oh a satellite is about to pass over your observation now Mm -hmm. pause for a minute while it goes and then carry on which would be great we cannot correct for it if you get a big bright trail of a satellite running across your image so I mean, some of the galaxies that I observe, the exposure times, like the, the time that I need to have the telescope actually collecting light from it and recording light is about two hours, right? And you do those in probably about 10 minute chunks, just in case anything mm-hmm. goes wrong. You don't want to lose two hours of observations, right? So you do it in chunks and also oh, okay. there's some variation okay. where like, eh, you know, a random high cirrus cloud might pass over or something like that. Sure. You don't want like a half an hour observation that's ruined by that. So you do it in these little 10 minute chunks. And there's a trade-off with that because it actually takes time to read out the detector as well. So there is some trade-off with, with how long you pick. So 10 minutes is a good chunk. But like say a satellite is going to pass over for 20 seconds of that 10 minutes when you've got an incredibly sensitive telescope that is designed to magnify light as much as possible, very faint light as well, that completely... Um, ruins that part of the image. So wherever it goes across the image, it will what's called it, it will probably bleed as well. So it will overexpose mm-hmm, the pixels mm-hmm. where the light does touch. Yeah. You can imagine sort of a detector as just lots of little buckets collecting a certain amount of light, and when they get full, they spill over into the next ones. Right. So it's a good analogy. Yeah. So like it's not just the pixels that it happens to pass over; it's the nearby pixels as well. And you could and it's just completely overexposed across your image that's not recoverable. That's not something mm-hmm. you can correct for like in post-processing. I can't hit a magic enhance button and that all go away, unfortunately. <laughs> enhance. You know, you, yeah, <laughs> you essentially lose a big chunk of your yeah. of the thing. Now, if you're looking at what's called an extended source, like I do, galaxies, right? They're extended over a, a quite a, a large patch of the sky. You might be able to say, okay, I lost this section of the galaxy and I'll just get rid of that in that one, I'll add it together. But if you're looking at something that's much more concentrated, like a star, or say you're even looking at the tiny bit of light from the star that's passed through the atmosphere of the exoplanet that's orbiting around it so that we can look to see what's in that atmosphere. Uh 
that'll be completely lost. Like you, it would completely glare out that entire thing if it passed over. So it's not something we could correct for, but it's something we can avoid if that data is shared with us. And I think that's along with other things that SpaceX has now done in liaison with the astronomical community after understanding Mm -hmm. how big of an issue this would be and that it wasn't just at sunset and sunrise because astronomers (laughs) have been doing this with for years and we do see we do see satellites throughout the night Mm -hmm. um you know like okay there is some stuff to make them less reflective but our telescopes are still sensitive to that so if they're less reflective it might not be noticed by a human eye and therefore the the sky wouldn't be ruined for generations to come because you won't have just the stars you'd have like constant satellites going over um there is still an issue to astronomy and especially also to radio astronomy because obviously Hmm. satellites do use light to communicate with the ground it's just not visible light it's usually radio waves because they're not impeded by clouds or anything like that and so i've seen radio observations where you have you know if you've ever been to a radio telescope before in the uk there's there's jodrell bank which is a big radio observatory in australia's the, the big parks one um, if you go on, on a, like a day visit, it's like a day trip out to see the little exhi- exhibitions they've got there and watch the telescope move. You have to turn your phone off. You cannot bring your phone in because the interference from it would completely ruin whoever's doing observations yeah. on a telescope that day. There's huge signs everywhere that says you can't have mobile phones, walkie talkies, whatever it is, no communication device switched on at all. Um, huh. And so if you, you can imagine a satellite going over a telescope that's designed to be super sensitive, like you just get this huge spike of mm-hmm. noise that completely drowns out whatever you're actually trying to detect, right? Mm-hmm. Which, you know, might be the hydrogen line that they, you know, they use in contact or whatever <laughs> to, to say that they've discovered aliens or whatever, because it's like embedded in it. Um, and so it's it, the biggest issue is with radio astronomy because mm-hmm. they also have huge fields of view as well. They don't just concentrate down like optical telescopes do. Right. They tend to look at like, you know, a, a big patch of sky at once. And so limit, like limiting the interference from satellites going over this big patch of sky at once is a, is a huge deal, mm-hmm. especially when they're lower Earth satellites like these big constellations will be. So it's, it's a huge, huge issue. And I don't think it's one that's going to be solved overnight. I think optical astronomy probably can mitigate for it with if, it, if the data is shared and if we can do these algorithms. But I think radio astronomy will struggle even more. Interesting. And people are like, oh, well, who cares about radio astronomy? But it's like so much we study with radio astronomy, like yeah. fast radio bursts at the minute are the big one. You know, we still don't know, really know what they are. Um, you've then got all the all the cool high energy stuff, right? It's like quasars and pulsars mm. and, and like flickering uh, AGN as well. That's all radio waves. And so there's a lot we need radio telescopes for and to, and to understand as well. So it's not just something that you can necessarily dismiss. And the yeah. idea that like, oh, we should just use space telescopes. Like, I mean, we get, we, there's just not the funding there. Like, you know, people yeah. balked at how much James Webb cost, right? At 10 billion. There's so many more ground-based stuff. There's so much more reliable observations you can do with ground-based because you don't have the danger of in space it going wrong and you can mm-hmm. correct it if something goes wrong, all this kind of stuff. So a ground-based astronomy will always have its place and to completely take that away with something like these constellations, I think would be a travesty because as we said, you get so much from asking these kind of questions mm-hmm. and so much tech that's improved through us pushing these boundaries to answer these questions. You know, by removing that, you know, you could remove some benefits to society down the line. And yes, okay, mega constellations internet to all is probably a massive benefit um you question whether that's their main gotta uh, do that yeah, yeah. <laughs> whether that's their main uh drive and whether it's not just like stock market exchanges quicker around the world i don't know <laughs> but um well yeah, yeah. um it's 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 a, it's a trade-off i think and i think there could be things that are done but they're not getting done at the minute yeah hmm. okay well, I always wanted to follow up with you on that because I didn't know exactly how, how big of a problem that was. What about airplanes? I mean, are there no fly zones around? Um... Yeah. yeah. Okay, I figured. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So like hmm. over Mount Ikea and stuff like that, right. and over the Atacama Desert in Chile, um, usually there'll be flight paths that are avoided. Somewhere in, like, in the Canary Islands, they'll have different approaches to the island to make sure they don't go over the observatory mm. uh, directly on top as well. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, well, cool. I think... I think I've kept you long enough. Hmm. But it's good to see you again. Um, yeah, yeah, it's fun. Oh, I never say congrats on a million, by the way. A million subscribers. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, that's kind of nuts. It's, it's been almost that's a so It's cool. Actually, it was just over a year. It was just before Christmas last year that nice. that happened. Well, I haven't seen you since. So. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I, I started to kind of go back and look and see when it was exactly that we talked. and But then I didn't because... 
it's always longer than I think it is. <laughs> and then I get depressed because it's like, oh, time is moving so fast. <laughs> It was the first lockdown in 2020, I think it was. Right at the beginning? Yeah. Wow, okay. Not quite at the beginning because it was really warm, so it must have been spring, summer at least. But Mm. Because I remember thinking it's really ironic that last time we spoke, I was absolutely boiling, and now I'm absolutely freezing. Oh. (laughs) January. Well, I, I just, I, like I said, I was watching your uh, reaction video to the launch, and I think the thing that cracks me up so much is that you're, you're so stressed out, and you're so just like, (laughs) exploding with with anxiety but you're wearing the most ridiculous christmas sweater (laughs) ever and there's like little rudolph noses poking (laughs) yeah it's 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 a real juxtaposition i think Uh, but i think it just brings home like you know like us astrophysicists like we're not like i all einstein's wearing lab coats all the time mm-hmm. whatever we are as weird and as wonderful and as normal <laughs> as everybody else is in this world so maybe yeah. even more so yeah but i don't know about that but yeah i was just like half trying to look after a turkey which is stressful enough oh and right <laughs> the launch, i was like yeah. my attention was split like, <laughs> like back and forth back and forth it was kind but of yeah. a mixed blessing at being on christmas because it was like a christmas gift but also like oh uh... Yeah, but then also to people who do explain science to the media, it was like my phone was oh, still ringing. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I'm on, I'm out of the office. I'm on holiday. Leave me alone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it's up there, and that's what matters. Yes, so. exactly. and it's unfolded. We actually have a yeah. telescope. Can't so. wait to see what comes out of it. It's amazing. Yeah, before it was unfolded, it was essentially just a load of really expensive junk in space. <laughs> now it's unfolded. It's actually a telescope. Some some extremely well engineered junk in space. Yeah. <laughs> all right well i'll let you go um i don't know when this might come out maybe uh maybe a couple of weeks i got uh one that should be coming out this week and i'm trying to do them every two weeks now but mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah if i decide to use maybe some of what we just talked about with the constellations thing in a video i'll let you know um okay, cool. obviously yeah, i'll yeah. get your permission for that and everything yeah, but, yeah uh, that's still in the works but mm-hmm. um well thanks and keep up what you're doing it's awesome yeah and you joe and I never know how to end these things. It's always awkward. So here we go. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's good talking to you. Yeah, I need you. Right. Cheers. Take care. Big thanks to Dr. Becky for taking some time out of her busy day of sciencing to talk to me. As always, I enjoy catching up with her. If you aren't following her on YouTube, then I don't know how you sleep at night. So go check her out, youtube.com slash Dr. Becky, I think. Or you can just search Dr. Becky and you can find her that way. You'll be glad you did. Today's intro music was submitted by Benji Arhel, or RL, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to pronounce that. Thanks, Benji, for sending that our way. Uh, the episode was produced by Kimmy Britt, editing by Bray Brown. I'm Joe Scott. You can follow me at Answers with Joe on all the social places, and of course, you can search Answers with Joe on YouTube to see my dumb face there. But that's it for today. Um, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed it, a nice review in your podcast player will help us reach more people and, and spread the word online or at the water cooler, whatever works for you. It's all helpful and it's all appreciated. So thanks again. Now go out there and start some conversations of your own. Mm-hmm.